Hi, I'm Jeff Watts and welcome to another of my top 10 tips videos. This video is about avoiding carryover. So this video is in response to the comment on my previous top 10 tips videos about distributed teams from Master Carpenter. Now, Master Carpenter had a number of challenges that he was facing, he listed a number of symptoms in the comments field, and we worked together to figure out that overall, what he really wanted some information and help on was how to avoid carryover at the end of a sprint. So, as I said, when people like, subscribe, and comment, there's a good chance that I'll pick your topic for a new video. So if you're interested in something you want some top 10 tips about, then just like this video, subscribe to my channel, and add something into the comments. And who knows, next time we could be looking at your challenges, your topics. So first of all, what is carryover? Well, most Agile teams work in iterations. And so at the start of that few weeks, sometimes two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, they will try and work out of all the things that they could be doing, perhaps it's a product backlog, perhaps it's a set of user stories, what do they think they're capable of delivering within that iteration? So they'll work with each other, they'll work with the product owner, find out what's involved, look at what skills they've got, and then estimate these items and try and work out you know, what, what they're capable of, what their capacity is. And then for that iteration, they'll give it their best shot, they'll work on things, and then at the end, they'll see what they actually managed to deliver, review, and use that information to plan the next sprint. Sometimes, however, they don't manage to deliver everything they plan to. And these items often get carried over into the next sprint. Hence the term carryover. And why is that a problem? Well, there are a few reasons why it could be an issue for us. Um, and I'll just pick out a few of them. Usually it's not a nice feeling to not complete everything. As human beings, we like to actually get a sense of closure on the work that we're doing. And if it's carried over, then it's just sort of hanging around. It's not a clean end of the sprint for the people actually doing the work, but also the stakeholders who we're delivering for. Morale can drop and it can easily become a habit that we get into. It's just something that happens. You know, I work with quite a few teams that will plan for this amount of work, knowing that they're probably only going to get this amount of work. And it just becomes the way that we do things. And it's not particularly inspirational. It's not particularly fun. But apart from that, it's actually not great quality wise. If we've got half done work hanging around, then it's quite difficult to actually close something out and deliver a potentially deployable increment with confidence that it's going to actually work. Half done work often leads to technical debt. And that causes support issues, which then makes it harder to commit to things because we've got an unknown amount of support work and bugs that we need to fix. And it can become a vicious cycle. Sometimes teams will respond to this situation by saying, well, let's just have a longer sprint. If we're struggling to fit things into two weeks and we've always got things hanging around, let's have three weeks. And then we've got more chance of delivering within that time frame. Sounds kind of logical. But really what I found is that actually teams then take on a bit more work and then struggle to fit things into three weeks. We talk about Parkinson's law, where the amount of time required to do something expands to fill the amount of time available. And if we're not getting into a habit of completing things, we're not gonna complete things in three weeks. That reduces our agility, it reduces our ability to deliver early, it reduces our ability to get feedback early. So longer sprints generally are not the answer even though it can feel logical to just give ourselves a little bit more time. If we're operating in an environment where perhaps we're trying to build up some confidence in the idea that an agile approach is a good way of working, then having carryover at the end of the sprint generally doesn't increase that level of confidence or trust in the team. It's much better to deliver a small amount of work and get it done than have a bigger chunk of work not done in terms of confidence, in terms of morale, in terms of predictability. So there are a number of reasons why having carryover isn't a great idea. But what can we do about it? That's where we go next. So my top 10 tips for avoiding carryover at the end of a sprint. At 10, have shorter sprints. That's right, I said shorter even though we just said don't have longer sprints, actually go the other way. 
If you're working in two week sprints and you're struggling to get things finished in two weeks, have one week sprints. It's a bit of a challenge. One week sprints are quite tough. But the principle behind it is you will have to take on less stuff. Your product owner will have to break things down into smaller chunks. Therefore, you increase your chance of getting something done. The smaller the time window that we're trying to estimate something in, the less range there is of us being wrong. So if we're 10% wrong of two weeks worth of work, that's twice as much out as if we're 10% wrong in one week's worth of work. It's easier to estimate, easier to plan, easier to commit and easier to get things done. Tip nine, use yesterday's weather. So I was told this story a while ago and I've no idea whether it was true, but it illustrates a point. So I was told that one company spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to predict the weather and they were pretty successful. They found that about 75% of the time, this machine could use the variables that was input and accurately predict what the weather was gonna be like the next day. And so the people who built the machine were pretty happy. After they'd used that machine for quite a while, they found that actually, if they just looked at what the weather was like today, it was 75% likely to be the same tomorrow. So just by using yesterday's weather as a predictor of tomorrow's was exactly the same accuracy as this really complex, really expensive machine that they built. How is that applicable to agile teams? We're not in the business of predicting weather, but we are in the business of predicting our capacity. And what we're saying there is the best predictor of future velocity, what the team can do in the next sprint, is what they actually did in this sprint. So if we've got some data saying that the team only managed to complete 90% of what they, what they commit to, yesterday's weather rule would suggest that you only commit to 90% of what you did commit to last time. Just commit to what you're actually capable of getting delivered. Why wouldn't teams do that anyway? Various reasons but they'll convince themselves that actually this sprint's gonna be different. We're gonna get better at predicting things. Maybe we are, but until we are, go with the data that we've got. Tip eight, now this might sound like a controversial one, feel guilty. I think every team should feel a certain amount of guilt if they don't manage to deliver what they said they were going to deliver in that sprint. Internal guilt, guilt to themselves, not necessarily to anybody else but a sense of, oh, I feel a bit bad that I didn't manage to do that. Because if we feel bad about it, then we're incentivized to do something about it. Maybe it's a case of having a minute's silence for the stories that fell during this sprint, that weren't managed to be completed. Actually spend a bit of time and effort thinking, hmm, that wasn't ideal. Let's do it better. Tip seven is reduce the work in process for the sprint. Similar to the tip about using yesterday's weather, if we're in the habit of taking on eight stories or eight product backlog items or eight requirements into the sprint, take four. Just take four. Plan for four, get four done. Now, hopefully, we'll still have some time left in the sprint when we've done half of what we thought we were capable of. We can still bring those other four in if we need to. Bring them in when there's time left, maybe one at a time. It's much easier to focus on getting things done if we have less things to focus on. Maybe we go really extreme and try and operate on this principle of single piece flow. One thing, bring it in, get it done, move on to the next. Tip six is reducing work in process for each individual skill area. So not just bring less stuff into the sprint, but make sure that we're not overloading one particular part of the development process or one particular skill area. If we're mapping out our flow of work through the sprint, perhaps we need to do some design during the sprint, we need to do some analysis during the sprint, we need to do some front-end work, some back-end work, some testing, some verification. Make sure that none of those stages is overloaded with too much work in process at any one point in time. So you set buffer limits, you set whip limits and so for argument's sake all right, when we've got two things that are in the queue for component testing we won't add a third until one of those things has been moved on and we will swarm everybody will gather around those items that are stuck and get them moving forward before we add any more work one of the most common failure patterns for an agile team in the early stages of self-organization is that we just focus on getting more and more stuff done individually 
rather than done at the team level. Tip five is actually recognize, reward and appreciate. Get a good feeling for things getting done. It is a good feeling getting things done. Imagine you've got a list of to-do items. Having that item crossed off or ticked off, that's a good feeling. So maximize that. I've worked in teams where they've banged a gong when they finish something, when there's a sense of ringing the bell, this one's complete, almost a mini celebration. Might feel a bit weird to begin with, but just really emphasize that feeling of getting things done because then we'll want to get more things done rather than keep things piling up in the not quite done column. Thinking about our daily scrum, that's the first question. What have we done since last time? That's the point of it. Get a sense of progress, get a sense of momentum, get a sense of, yes, we've completed something and look around at your teammates when we say, yes, I've completed this. Congratulate that person, recognize that person, appreciate that. Tip four, protect the team from distractions. Another common reason why teams don't get things completed and have things carry over is because during the sprint, something happens that actually distracts them from their commitment. Their focus is taken away. Whether that's new requirements coming in or disturbances in the actual environment, anything that's distracting the team or disturbing the team from their focus, eliminate it. Protect the team from those distractions. Make it clear to everybody else that this team has got some really important stuff that they're focusing on and they need to get it done. Tip three, don't allow undone work to be demonstrated in the sprint review. In a similar way to rewarding, recognizing and appreciating stuff that's done, don't be tempted to give partial credit for partially done work. That might seem harsh, but if it's not done, it's no use. Don't incentivize partially complete work. Don't recognize it. It's not done, doesn't come to the sprint review. We don't get credit for it. Simple. Tip two, help the team want to get things done. Now I said there's motivating factors to getting things done, but it's all well and good me saying that. It's only useful if the team actually believed that themselves. So talk to them. When was a good feeling during the last sprint? When are we at our happiest? When do we get those biggest sense of achievement, that biggest sense of completion? And help them visualize that, help them really uh, substantiate that within themselves and then ask them, would they like to feel more of that? If the answer is yes, then we can move on to tip one. Tip one, my top tip for helping teams avoid carryover in the sprint is ask the team members themselves what's worked for them in the past when they've wanted to get things done. This doesn't have to be work related. It can be anything, anything outside of work, their chores, um, their habits that they've tried to get into, anything at all where they've managed to get things done, they got into a habit of getting things done. How have they formed that habit? And see if they can transfer that learning, those habits, into the work environment. Perhaps they like making lists. Perhaps they like rewarding themselves for getting things completed. What works for them and build that into more of the daily routine so that they can get more of that good feeling that I identified in tip two. It's all for the team's benefit. I can try and force people to get things done or I can make them realize how much they want it and then give them the opportunities to get more of that. So that's my top 10 tips. A quick recap. Use shorter sprints. Use yesterday's weather. Feel a bit guilty about not getting things done. Reduce the working process for the sprint. Reduce the working process for each stage in the sprint and swarm. Value getting things done. Protect the team from distractions. Don't allow undone work to be demonstrated in the sprint review. Help the team want to get things done and ask each member of the team what's worked for them in the past in getting things done. Well, I hope that video was of use to you, especially Master Carpenter. And if any of you out there are thinking, well, I'd like to see some top 10 tips on another particular topic, all you need to do is like the video, subscribe to the channel, and add something in the comments field, and we'll see what we can do. Until next time, 
Take care.